The story of Chet Hansen, a 27-year-old nature photographer from Wilkeson, Washington, is strange and mysterious. Even the national parks could not explain it. Today, we will look at what happened to him and several other strange cases of those who ventured into the outdoors. Now, Chet was an outdoorsy person known for his love of photography. He had the talent to capture the beauty of nature like no one else. On a sunny morning of November 11th, 1997, Chet woke up with an exciting plan ahead of him. He thought of heading out on a photography trip to the wonderful Mount Rainier National Park near his home. An excited Chet packed about 35 pounds of camera equipment, which included lenses and a tripod. And for any photographers out there, you'll know this is packing lightly. He set off on this adventure, promising his mom he'd return for dinner. He wasn't planning on going far, just a famous trail called the Deer Creek Falls Trailhead. Now the trail was easy and well worn, and the weather was warm and sunny, perfect for a fall day and photography. But as time passed, Chet did not return. His chair sat empty at dinner, his mother's worry increased. She tried not to fret too much, thinking he might have extended his trip with some friends. But when he didn't turn up for work the next day, his absence elicited a greater concern. He was reported as a missing person, and the hunt for Chet began. The police found Chet's car parked at his designated trailhead, and inside the vehicle, they found an assortment of items, a set of photography equipment, keys, and among them were images from Highway 410 and Tipsu Lake. But there was no sign of Chet nor his hefty load of camera equipment. An extensive search followed, but no evidence of Chet was ever discovered. In addition to the police, a troop of volunteers and sniffer dogs were called in to aid the search. However, just like a puff of smoke vanishing in thin air, there seemed to be no trace of Chet anywhere. It was as if he just disappeared without leaving any tracks. During the search, a man named Willard Olson and his girlfriend mentioned seeing someone who resembled Chet near Shriner Peak around lunchtime on that fateful day. This gave the search team a glimmer of hope, but they could not locate him despite the clues. Despite searching high and low in every nook and cranny, Chet Hansen and his prized photography equipment were never found. It was almost as if he disappeared off the face of the earth. And so, the mystery of what happened to the adventurous and talented photographer, Chet Hansen, remains unsolved. Love and respect to him and his grieving family. Now, as tragic as his disappearance is, thousands of people are going missing in the wilderness and national parks every single year. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not slowing down. While he seems to have completely vanished, there are other strange things to have been experienced in the woods. Is it possible that Chet experienced something similar like these following accounts before he vanished? A post from a Redditor with the username Magnific Cone claimed that they had an odd and terrifying experience when they were young and camping with their Boy Scout troop in Mount Washington. At that time, he was with a bunch of other Boy Scouts and they were slowly climbing up a twisty path on the mountain when two people he was with decided to stop and rest. But he felt a weird, strong need to continue, accompanied by lost time. It was almost as if he was in some sort of trance. Once my group and I got above tree line and by several boulders, my two friends decided to slow down and drink water. I don't know why, but I was overcome by an urge that pulled me to keep moving. Eventually, I got lost. My perception of time vanished. It felt like a dream because I kept changing locations, but I couldn't remember walking there and I never questioned it. Somehow, I got to a cliff and suddenly I was by a huge pile of rocks. I began feeling sick and dizzy. I took off my gray and olive windbreaker to reveal my neon scout shirt and I folded my windbreaker into a pillow and I laid down. Suddenly, a man dressed in black tights with a red cross, I think he worked there, I don't know ran towards me and told me that I looked dehydrated and that there was a weather station I could eat at. I put on my jacket after getting cold and headed up to the weather station. I met up with my troop there and they were worried and informed me that I was missing for almost an hour. 
When we made it back down, I fell asleep in the car and was drained. Redditor Bellabino143 had her own X-Files type experience to share. When she was only 11 years old, her family would often go camping in New Hampshire's wilderness in their trailer nearly every summer vacation. She claimed that during one of these trips, her aunts had awakened her and asked her if she had any memory of the previous evening, to which she declined. Then, the aunt, mother, and father would tell her exactly what happened. It was something she could not begin to believe. My aunt was a bit shaky as she asked, Do you remember what happened last night? I shook my head, no, and listened as my aunt told me about the extremely strange night, which I did not recall whatsoever. My aunt explained that at about 2 in the morning, she woke up to the door of the camper being wide open. She quickly checked the bunks and noticed that I was nowhere to be found. She woke up my mom and dad, and then my mom and dad got flashlights and started frantically searching for me outside around the immediate area. My aunt stayed behind because there were still four kids sleeping in the camper. After a scary 10-minute search, my dad spotted me. I had walked out of the camper and into the trees about 30 feet away. It was far enough that I could not be seen unless he walked into the trees a bit. I was just standing out there in the dark, with my eyes completely open, but not responding to him at all. I had no shoes, no flashlight, and was wearing just shorts and a t-shirt. He said that he grabbed my hand and started walking me back to the camper. He remembers asking me, what's going on? Why in the world would you go out there on your own like that? Then. I finally spoke up saying, I need to wait here, dad. Let's just stay here. My mom remembers I then started crying as she and my dad led me back to the camper. Whenever I think back to this story, I get a sick, strange feeling. Thank God my aunt woke me up when she did. It's important to note that I've never been known to sleepwalk before or after that night. It was an isolated incident, which could have had a very different ending had I not been so lucky. My mother was so upset that she decided to get rid of the trailer, and we didn't do much camping after that night. There are instances where the call to venture into the unknown is not just an urge to leave. Sometimes it's a being, an entity that operates beyond human comprehension. This becomes clear in a weird report by a poster with the username of Super Symbiote. The tale involves her mother's mysterious encounter that took place years ago in the secluded rural outskirts of Urabuca, Paraguay. As a young girl, her mother, accompanied by her grandmother, enjoyed an innocent day of playing outside. Then, as if directed by an unseen yet powerful force, she was compelled to wander into the deep woods nearby. What transpired next is chilling. The area where my mom grew up is especially rural in the countryside, where most of the poor people were. Her house was across from very thick woods that stretched for miles. One afternoon, before it got dark, my grandma and mom were outside. My mom was about seven at the time when she spotted what she described as a beautiful little white baby chick. She always loved animals and enjoyed catching them, so she wanted to catch it. It kept running away from her, even though it seemed like she was just about to catch it multiple times. After what seemed like she was running in a circle for minutes, my grandma came out of nowhere and yanked my mom's hair. My mom said at that moment she was broken from a trance that the sun had already set and she was actually very deep in the woods. My grandma smacked her really hard on the head and told her that El Pombero almost succeeded at taking her. My mom tried to explain to my grandma about the pretty little chick, but of course it was nowhere to be found. My grandma said my mom seemed to be playing normally and then all of a sudden just started fast walking towards the woods. My grandma thankfully ran after her and was able to catch up to her. I always think about what would have happened had my grandma not been there to stop it. I'm glad she was there. Shooting over to Nicaragua, we have a similar account from a Redditor named Monkey85. When they were just at the tender age of six, they stayed with their grandmother on a large plantation. Now, this was surrounded by dense rainforest on all sides. One day, when it was bright and clear, she was out on a trail with her parents walking back to the plantation from their jeep, and she described what happened. I remember playing with one of my favorite toys. It was the Green Ranger that you could push a button and his head would switch from his normal head to his helmet. 
Anyways, I was playing with it as we walked along the trail. We then arrived to a small stream. My parents are easily able to jump over it and keep walking. They look behind them, and I could see them watch me try to make the jump smiling at me. I do make the jump, but drop my toy in the process and it gets picked up by the stream, so I immediately start following after it. I can hear my parents yelling for me, but I'm too focused on catching my toy. This next bit I still remember vividly to this day. All of a sudden, I'm like in a field with very tall grass. It's surrounded by trees. The one thing I notice is that it's eerily quiet. I have to reiterate that this is a Central American forest. It is never quiet. There are always hundreds of birds, monkeys, and other small animals everywhere. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. Then I hear something weird, like chirping, and I see small, tiny orbs in the tall grass. I'm not afraid of them, more like intrigued. They're amongst the grass like the way you would see an animal's eyes, but they're weightless and floating. I start walking towards them, but then I get scared and run away towards the forest. I remember getting sleepy as I fell against the tree trunk. I was missing for two days, and the next thing I remember is waking up in the back of a bus, and the bus driver waking me up and asking if I was okay. I immediately start crying and asking for my mom. My mom had me memorize our home number, so they call and I get picked up by police. Police investigate it, thinking it may have been a kidnapping attempt. They think once they found out who was kidnapped, they put me in the bus. I tell them my story, and a few of them think duendes took me. Duendes is something a lot of the people in Nicaragua believe in, especially people out in the fields. It's less believed in the major cities. They're basically described like small people who kidnap children, kill livestock, or ruin crops. Basically mischievous little things. A telltale sign of them being present is seeing small floating orbs and lights and trees or amongst tall grass. People say it's their lanterns that they carry. How do we explain away such a bizarre set of circumstances when these are far from isolated? In fact, folks, thousands of other cases nearly identical to this story are taking place all over the country in a very similar fashion. You know, it's interesting to note that these don't seem exclusive to North or South America, but the entire world. However, these reports don't exist solely with hikers and outdoor enthusiasts of the woods. Search and rescue as well as park rangers have their own sightings to detail as well, like this one. I'm running to report something strange near Yosemite National Park, where I used to work in my 20s. Both incidents occurred in the scenic Sierra Nevada mountains within the park's boundary. The first incident occurred near an evacuated campsite that my fellow rangers and I used to patrol at dusk. We always thought we were alone until one prevalent evening, a camper approached us with a video he took of what he believed to be someone stalking their campsite. He took the video on his phone, so it was hard to determine anything definitive. This was 2009, and phones weren't the best at taking videos from a distance. I mean, even now. The footage showed what appeared to be a sizable bipedal person concealing itself behind dense foliage in the distance, with the witness completely spooked. The testimony of the camper never alluded to something other than human. Still, the footage was not a person in a costume. It was a large shape that we couldn't really define. Nothing ever further became of that, and we didn't discuss it further. The second story I'd like to share would take place in the park's high country. It was in a remote area called the Tuolumne Meadows. An older gentleman contacted us about a large wolf coming out of the forest near his cabin. He stated that it seemed like an ordinary adult wolf at first glance. However, when he tried to scare off the creature by yelling at it, it rose up on its hind legs, exposing an unusually high stature of more than six feet. Not only was this incredibly unnerving, but he was struck by this thing's level of intelligence, which it seemed to show, described as both perversely captivating and terrifying. He had never seen anything like it. The man claimed this animal returned multiple times the following evening to try and break into his truck. The issue here is that there is no wolf populations anywhere around Yosemite last time I checked. I was convinced this older gentleman must have been mistaken. Possibly medication, who knows. My guess is that he got frightened by seeing an overly large coyote, but it's hard to tell for sure. 
I'm very skeptical about these things, but these aren't the first or the only stories I've heard from others I've worked with or hikers in the vicinity. The one that stands out the most is a good friend years back who had a close encounter with what he referred to as a wild man deep in the Sierra Nevadas just outside the park boundary. I had asked him if he meant Bigfoot, but he was unequivocal in his wording. He described them as a group of feral wild men that were over seven feet and covered in hair. They looked like bears. I have never seen them myself, but I have heard others mention it before. Make of it what you will. I'm just sharing stories with all of you from my tenure there. Ladies and gentlemen, these things aren't exclusive to the modern day. In fact, a strange report in the 1800s in Dover, New Jersey spoke of something out of the ordinary. On January 8, 1894, a news story from Dover, New Jersey sparked a flurry of interest. It spoke about a mysterious and potentially dangerous person-like creature lurking in the area near Mine Hill. The tale attracted many hunters curious to glimpse this strange entity. The press reported, a wild man lives in the woods near Mine Hill. Despite this, the search party feeling cold, even in our thick jackets, this wild man seems to manage well with just his thick facial hair, which serves as his only protection against the winter cold. Although the story led to quite a bit of skepticism and uncertainty, a brave few were still forthcoming about their encounters and ready to publicly discuss these strange events, which is significant when dealing with controversial mysteries. Among these brave souls were three local girls. Katie Griffin, Bertha Hestig, and Lizzie Guscott. These girls were workers at the Dover Silk Mill. The surprise meeting with the wild man led to a screaming match between all four parties involved, with the wild man eventually retreating into the woods. Bertha shared her impressions with the press. He didn't wear any shoes, and he could have done well with some mutton fat smeared on his chest to protect him from the cold. Many others came forward to share their interpretations and experiences of the wild man. Noteworthy among them were two local men known only as Bill and Mike. According to the print media's recounting of their story, the duo were woodcutters who had first seen the wild man while doing their duties. The sighting occurred the previous Friday near a remote location called Indian Falls. Their dogs drew their attention to a large rock by barking wildly, prompting both men to prepare themselves for a possible encounter with a bear or other dangerous animals. However, they encountered a stranger, a man with a wild appearance instead. They described him as mid-aged, around six feet tall, and weighing around 180 pounds. His distinguishing features were his long matted hair and a thick, grimy beard, which added to his overall uncivilized appearance. Upon spotting Bill and Mike, the wild man scampered toward the rocks, throwing his arms about in an unusual manner. Bill and Mike then decided to go after the strange figure, which turned out to be an ill-advised move. The wild man retaliated by picking up a club, it's unclear where he retrieved it, and threatened the men with it. One of the men's dogs was injured in this encounter, leading to the men fleeing hastily from the scene. Now, understandably, this encounter triggered a larger effort to uncover the truth behind this mysterious wild man. As stated by the press at the time, a scouting party was quickly formed under the supervision of City Marshal James Hagen and Policeman Tredenick. The team headed towards the incident site only to find that the wild man had vanished into the thick woodland. However, they managed to find footprints in the mud, which confirmed the presence of the wild man. The search parties were relentless, with groups scouting the mountains each day. The wild man remained elusive despite 50 men sweeping the area on Saturday and more groups searching on Sunday. Nestled in West Sussex, England, you'll find Clapham Wood, a mystical forest standing guard over the quaint village of Clapham. This timeless English village, which likely dates back to Saxon times, has been hidden from the world's eye for 300 years. Until the last 40 years, a thick veil of mystery, murder, and tales of a secret society called the Friends of Hecate transformed this peaceful hamlet. The chilling tale unfolded in 1972 with the strange disappearance of a police officer named Peter Goldsmith. Upon entering the innocent woods, Goldsmith vanished without a trace only to be found lifeless six months later. 
adding a layer of intrigue to this grim event, it's worth noting that Goldsmith, two months before vanishing, had investigated the murder of a woman who had also met her fate in the same woods. It's as if the two victims were bound by a distressing, unseen supernatural bond. It gets a lot stranger. In 1975, Leon Foster, an elderly man, had disappeared and was discovered dead by a couple looking for their lost horse in the woods. Then, on Halloween of 1978, the beloved Reverend Harry Snelling, Clapham's vicar, also went missing. It took three years for a wandering Canadian tourist to stumble upon his remains. Strangely, there was no apparent cause of death. But it doesn't end there. In 1981, the woods claimed another life, that of Julian Matthews. Tragically, this person who suffered from schizophrenia was savagely raped and murdered within the chilling confines of these woods. Adding to the nature of these woods, even local dogs began to mysteriously vanish. With its grim history laced with murder, disappearances, and unexplained events, Clapham Woods gained a sinister reputation. Then, in 1987, a bombshell went off that made everything a lot worse. An ominous group, rumored to have ties to the British government, known as the Friends of Hecate, emerged from the shadows, claiming Clapham Woods as their own. This revelation first appeared in The Demonic Connection, a book penned in 1987 by Toyin Newton, Charles Walker, and Alan Brown. Walker, who allegedly met a secret society member, learned that the unsettling events in the woods, the deaths, the disappearances, and even the vanishings of dogs and animals were the work of the Friends of Hecate. This allegedly dangerous occult group has been described as a quasi-pagan British occult order. Whether the existence of the group is confirmed or not, the tales of Clapham Woods are enough to keep the legend of the Friends of Hecate alive and chilling to the bone. Now, Terry, a 27-year-old paranormal enthusiast from New Orleans, shared her disturbing experience from 2016. She spent only two months in England visiting relatives and looking forward to exploring the infamous Clapham Woods. Armed with her copy of The Demonic Connection, she entered the woods and encountered the most strangest thing, a fleeting encounter with a black-eyed child. A brief yet unsettling encounter that added another layer of macabre mystery to everything already set. As Terry ventured into the woods further, she caught sight of a little girl dressed in a black hoodie and jeans. The little girl giggled in probably the most creepiest, terrifying way possible, and when she saw, the child's eyes were the most frightening thing. They were completely black, a sight that chilled her to the bone. As quickly as this black-eyed girl appeared, she was gone, leaving Terry in fear. Gasping for air, she quickly made her way out of the woods. Yet, despite the terrifying experience, she dared to return to the same woods only three days later. But thankfully, there wasn't a second encounter with the strange black-eyed child. An anonymous Park Service employee would also have a strange account with what they described as a black-eyed entity in June of 2005. I had an experience at Devil's Canyon near my place in Vernon, British Columbia. This happened roughly five or six years ago. There's a long road that I was patrolling during the early morning hours. It was roughly 2.30 in the morning. Near the road is a major highway, and you could practically always hear noise from it. I will say that this night, it was strange in that it was eerily silent all around. It was almost like the environment around me was awaiting what was to come. A large deer began to emerge from the right side of the road directly in front of me. My vehicle came to a slow. As the deer ran out and crossed the road, something I've never seen before ran after it without ceasing. The only reason I saw it as good as I did was because my headlights were on it. This thing was really tall and skinny, gray and snowy looking. It was gaunt, almost starved looking. It had a strange gait and kind of loped across the road after the deer. The figure outline was very distinct and the face was elongated with a rounded cranium. After a few strides, the thing was gone. The length of its limbs was very wrong in comparison to everything else. Its arms and legs were skinny with larger than normal hands and feet. The figure lacked any trace of hair or fur, but its eyes, oh boy, its eyes were the true attention grabbers. 
They were twice as big as a human's and a deep, inky black. I really have no way to explain what I saw. I like to think of it as something that was created in a lab and escaped. I've only ever told a handful of people about this. And because you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to comment down below, vanished without a trace, so I know who made it to the end of the video. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll catch all you crazy cats in the very next video.